you have your Bibles, open to uh, the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. Revelation, chapter number 20. <clears throat> I think some of y'all got nervous when Rick was up here talking about the, the um, pastor's appreciation. That's, that's always kind of a hard thing for me to go through. I told him in the first service, it's like going to the dentist and having to do it without Novocaine, having to hear them talking about the pastor's appreciation. But he, then he said, in the preaching hour, he said, listen to Brian in the preaching hour, and y'all got nervous, didn't you? <laughs> I pray that I don't preach an hour. I pray that I preach just as long as I'm supposed to, not any longer than, than that. Uh, Mark, let, let it slip. Today's his 34th wedding anniversary with that beautiful woman, Beth. Amen. <laughs> well, I was about to say, I, you know, it's your... You know, she just haven't, we could call hers different than we could. You get the anniversary, she gets the endurance. How's that? <laughs> Something like that. We're just grateful that she said yes, and I'm always grateful Lynn said yes, right? That's an amen hallelujah moment right there. Um, thank y'all for coming today. Thank y'all for who are watching online for being with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a good day. It's a, a glorious time in the Lord. All the things that God's been good to us about, we get to come and we get to celebrate. And uh, y'all, I get to watch y'all while y'all sing in the choir. They get up here and spread out, and some of them uh, get to be up here and to, to see their smile when they get to sing. And it's just always a wonderful time to be with the Lord and to talk with y'all. And it just seems like everything is so good and so wonderful. And I'm just grateful that I, I get to know y'all and we could spend some time together. So um, um, let's just look at this word. Uh, we've been in a series called Faith and Blessing. And God tells us that we, we find God but through faith. I've never seen him in person, but I've seen him a million different ways. I've never audibly heard a voice, but he spoke to me time and time and time and time again. Because that's how God comes and he, he reveals himself and the blessings that come from it. And this word is such a wonderful word because uh, it's, it's God... Um, opening up his truth to us. There's three things that we know. I've always said that when, when we find the things that live forever, number one, God, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He lives forever. Number two, his word, it never fails. Not one jot, not one tittle is going to pass away till all of it is fulfilled. It's always truth. It lives forever. And the third thing that lives forever is the soul of man. Whether you're a believer, you're not a believer, uh, you're going to live forever. That soul, that spirit, that, that is who you are, that's going to live forever. But I've kind of added to that a little bit. Maybe I've thought about it again, and, and I just want to remind you that God's uh, abode, our eternity, God's abode is forever. For those that are believers in Jesus Christ, there's a place that we've been, I've preached about last Sunday, we've been talking about some on Wednesday night, there's a place called heaven. Just that term, heaven, it just means everything that's good. Matter of fact, something, if we say that was good, like when my wife makes me homemade biscuits, can I get an amen? We say, man, that's heaven. Well, I hope heaven's more than that. Not saying that her biscuits aren't great, right? But it's, we want, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God's prepared for us. Heaven is the place where, where everything, that's what God's word tells us, everything that is of the nature and the goodness and the love and the joy and the peace and the blessings of the Almighty, it's everything for us that God's extended to us. Why would we not want to be there? Why would we not want to enjoy that? Why would we not want to have the greatest of the great forever and ever and ever? Amen? But that's only half the story. Because we need to, we need to tell the full gospel story. We need to tell us everything about the Word of God. And I, I, I made a promise a lot of years ago that if I talk about heaven, then I've got to talk about the alternative too. If I talk about the beauty and the splendor of the city four square, 1,500 miles high, wide, long, that beautiful place where, where the, 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 the walls of jasper, a diamond, the, the, the gold streets that's actually pure gold, just crystal clear, uh, you know, the picture that we get 
of, of heaven is the picture of the outside. It's never the picture of the inside. All we told about in the inside is that's where the glory of God is. Everything that is the nature of the power and the goodness of God, the glory of God that will be seen, and that's what will make heaven heaven. There will be no shadows. There will be no uh, gray areas. It will be the brightness of the splendor of God everywhere. But we also need to understand that there's an alternative to that. And, and you don't have to go to heaven if you don't want to. And God's word tells us that, his, that he's there for us. And every time we open the Bible to a passage, we find uh, truth to live by. He gives us a greater understanding of God and his nature, uh, of his outstretched hand of loving us. But we also see the stories of man grappling with that truth. You read it in the Old Testament. And we, we see all these stories of these people. And some of them see by faith, they see God, and they obey God, and they trust God, and the blessings that follow. But then there's also the stories of those people who hear and something that, it, that, that they lose the wrestling match in their soul. And they choose to go another way. And we need to hear that too. We need to, to, to know the word of God talks about those people who trust by faith and believe. And the blessings that come upon them and their posterity because they are, they're, they're trusting God as their savior. But we also need to know the stories of those who don't. We need to see their struggles. We need to see how they grapple with the truth. And their, man is always looking for their own understanding of the truth. So the Bible is the unveiling of God and his desire for us and his desire for a relationship with us. But it's also the story or the unveiling of man and his sinful condition and how man wants his way and how man wants to do what man wants to do. And how we um, don't want to hear what truth is. We want to hear what blesses us. We love hearing stories about heaven. Don't let's not talk about the other stuff. Oh, preacher, don't be negative. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that is, is becoming uh, 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 very normal for us to understand with preachers. Oh, preacher, we want you to preach about the, the encouragement of Christ, the love of Christ. We want you to preach about heaven and the goodness and the joy, all that other stuff that's negative. They say it's negative. We don't, want to, we don't care to hear about that. We don't, we don't want to hear about all those things. Look, when I traveled to church this morning, I came down 365. And I get, to, I get on a pretty quickly, and most of my drive's down the four lane, and I'm going 65 miles an hour, maybe 70. Maybe 72, I don't know. Used to, it was 80, 85, but I'm not doing that anymore, amen? And, and, and it's pretty straight roads, and you get up there, and you see that green light, and I just smile, and I'm just listening to the music on the radio, and I'm singing with Jesus and singing for Jesus, and everything's good. And then, all of a sudden, that yellow light comes on, and my countenance changes. And I'm like, there's nobody at that light. There's nobody on the left. There's nobody on the right. Why in the world are they throwing that caution light at me? And that's what yellow means, right? It means caution. Beware. Something bad's about to happen. And y'all know what happens. After the yellow light set, what? Red light. And how many of y'all, when you see that red light, you're going, Ugh. I mean, you just, why is that? You think somebody's up there behind a tree with a switch, and they see you coming, and they're like, I'll get them. And I'll throw the switch, and the red light will come on. And you look at it, and, and look, when, when, what's supposed to happen is you take your foot off the gas when you see the yellow light. But some of us want to hit the gas a little stronger. I can make it. I'll go through. And, and, if, and, and if there's nobody on the left and there's nobody on the right, you're thinking to yourself, why in the world am I going to have to stop all the way out here? There's, it's just me. Why do I have to stop? But listen, we've made a, a, a contract with society that when we got our driver's license that we would follow the laws. Amen? Don't say, oh, me. And, and, and when, it, when it comes up red light, whether there's anybody at the intersection or not, we're supposed to stop. And we say to that, amen. Not a one of you. <laughs> and then we'll get to that place. Now, what happens if we say, we may stop 
and grumble the whole way? Or if you, what happens if you don't obey the, the, the law of the red light? I mean, you like the law of the green light. And, and you understand that the law of the yellow light's for your good. And the law of the red light, you might not like. But if you don't obey the law of the red light, you will understand the law of the blue light. <laughs> Amen? And then uh, uh, when, when the blue light comes and you're pulled over and, and you, then you say, Oh, but uh, officer, and you'll give them a thousand reasons why you don't need that ticket. And good luck with that, by the way. Uh, if, if you don't obey the, the laws that are there, it is your, their responsibility to say, here's the price you pay for that. And if you're going real fast, they'll give you a real good price to pay for that. When I was a kid, we went to Niagara Falls. I, I think I was somewhere around 10 years old. It might be 9 or 10, I'm not sure. But we drove all the way up to, to, to New York, and we went over to, to, to Niagara Falls. And, and, and you see it on TV. How many of y'all been? Some of y'all, you see it on TV and you're thinking, hell, that's a waterfall. When you get up there and you look at that thing, that's a whole lot of waterfall. I mean, it's great big and that's a whole lot of water coming over that thing. And I remember a sign, I assume it's still there. I hadn't been there in almost a half a century. There's a sign called the point of no return. And, and, and that when that sign is there, it, what it's saying is, is watch out because if you fall in Beyond the point of no return, we'll pray for you. You're not going to swim your way out of that. I mean, you, you have reached a point where <clears throat> you better turn around because if you pass the point of no return, you're going over that falls. It's a warning. Now, there's going to be always somebody who wants to jump in there and say, I don't care what they say. I'm a good swimmer. I can swim past it. Well, good luck with you. And after you go, bloop, 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 you know, it's, on, it's, it's your own fault, right? Because the warning was there. If you're going down the road, and after last week we got, what, six inches of rain? Some people said five, some people said seven inches of rain. And there were some roads washed out, amen? We saw them. They caught it at once in a hundred years. And, and if there's a big old neon sign saying, caution, road out, you better stop. And if you don't, and you travel at your own wisdom, you travel at your own peril. If you pick up, I don't smoke, but if you pick up a pack of cigarettes that says, if you smoke this, you may get cancer. I mean, they put it right there, but then there's somebody that's going to go, oh, right? Because I, I don't care, I'm going to smoke it anyway. Well, good luck with that. And I know people have fussed and fought over the, the, the mask, should we wear a mask? I don't want to wear a mask. Uh, hold on. It, it, you're, most of the time I'm looking at wearing the mask, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for everybody else. I still haven't figured that out. You, can't catch, you can catch it with the mask on, but you keep from giving it to somebody else. Somebody's going smarter than me is going to have to explain that to me, but that's what they say, so I wear the mask when I'm supposed to, right? Or you can just not wear the mask, and you just catch whatever you catch. I'm going to laugh at you. I'm going to point my finger at you and laugh at you, right? No. Listen, there are laws that are out there that are for our own good. And we want to look at them and we want to say, hey, that's for everybody else. Well, hold on. God's got some warning signs too. And when we talk about heaven, when you, how many of y'all believe there's a place called heaven? Raise your hand. Look at that. And if you ask people, are you going to heaven? Non-believers will say Yes. I believe in heaven. Yes, I'm going to heaven. Uh, why should you go to heaven? Why are you going to heaven? Well, uh, I'm a pretty good person. I don't kick my dog. You know, I pay my bills on time. Don't run too many red lights, right? I'm a good person. Anyway, we've got inside of us uh, our own system of what we think is good and right. And by the way, we make that up ourselves. We'll look at this and we'll say, well, that's a sin. I know it's a sin, but it's almost like we say it's an understandable sin. Now that over there, I'd never do that. Oh, I'd, I'd never do that. But, you know, I'm a pretty good person. When I get up there, God's got to love. He'll let me in. Be careful about that theology of self-righteousness. One of the things that gets me today. Hmm. I've heard it described as, as a mountain theology. 
No matter where you start at the base of the mountain, we're all climbing the mountain and finding God at the top. Well, that sounds all nice and good, doesn't it? But, but they'll say, if you're a Christian, then that's the choice and that's the path that you'll take and you'll reach God at the top. But if you're a Jew and you want to go by Judaism, or if you're a Mormon, you want to go by, by Mormonism or uh, Islam, or maybe just uh, good works, or you know, whatever it may be, self-righteousness, or socialism. By the way, that's one of the new isms today that people are worshiping is socialism or communism. There's people in our world today that thinks that's going to be the, the way to having splendor and, and God's utopia, nirvana, having good karma, you know, make it to heaven some way, somehow. Be careful. This mountain theology, the only problem with that is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, you say, well, pastor, that's exclusionary. Look, when we come to this word, we don't take what we think, we take what it says. Now, there's, they, they taught us uh, in, in seminary, there, there are two ways of looking at Scripture. And you won't remember the words, I'm going to share them with you, but it won't m matter to you. What you'll, hopefully what you'll get is the concepts of it. One's called exegesis. That means you let the Word of God speak for itself. You come to it, you read the Word of God, and you let it speak. And you just say, uh, I'm going to, I don't know what, it, what, what truth is, but I'm going to find it here. And when I find it here, that's what I'm going to follow. Amen? That's what I seek to do. I don't want to stand up in my wisdom and just say, hey, this is what y'all need to do. Matter of fact, I hate preachers who will take a, a scripture and they'll just read one verse and then they'll just take off and they call it good preaching. And they just never mention that scripture at all. But really what you're getting is them, right? And that's all you got when, is you just got them. Now the other way of looking at it is not exegesis, but it's eisegesis. And that means you've got a preconceived concept and you go to scripture to back up your preconceived concept. That's dangerous. But I'm seeing more of that in the world than any other time that I've ever been around. We've got a, something going on in America that they're, they're trying to uh, choose to confirm or not confirm a new uh, honorable Supreme Court justice. And she seems like a nice, fine young lady, and she seems like she's very smart and brilliant and knows constitutional law. She's a Catholic, and she's... Uh, got seven children, five of her own. They've adopted two, all those things. But, but if you, if you, how many of y'all watched any of that, heard any about it? There's two groups, and you can tell them. Well, this group over here, they've got their mind made up, and they're going to look at, when they look at her, they're not looking at her. They're looking at how they think, and they're going to ask and twist and do all this. And this group over here, they're doing the same thing, but in the opposite. They believe in her, period, and that's just all that it matters. When the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I'm going to be real honest with you. we got an election coming up, and I hear people say, well, I'm going to vote party line this way, or I'm going to vote party line that way. Be careful, because there's no, there's no, well, I almost said religion, but that's about the, the truth of it. There is no political party that I'm with all the way. I'm not with this side, and I'm not with that side. I'm with Jesus. And I think if you're going to vote for a candidate, vote for the candidate. Well, I don't know. I'm voting for the party. Well, you're voting for a lot of things you may not agree. My mama said, that, 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 uh, you know, the wisdom of mama. She said she couldn't vote for someone because she was always having to vote against somebody. Well, sometimes in politics today, that may be what it sounds like. But, you know, what I'm telling you is, is they've got an idea already figured out. And they're just trying to get everybody to agree with them. The only times that works, if the per one who has the right idea is God. And we agree with him. If you come to life and, and people say, well, I, this is just what I think, well, bless you. You better make sure that what you think is what God says. Because if, if, if what you think is different from what God says, somebody's wrong, and it's not him. And it, it, I, I've made this decision. Look, it is wrong for me to preach of the glories of heaven without telling you that there are other things that are out there that if you do not choose Jesus, you will one day face. You need to know that. There's this big neon light that God's shining saying, love, joy, peace, truth, 
Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. You need to know that he's there to help you, not to hurt you. He's not there to to try to manipulate you, but he's going to tell you the truth. So let's look at exactly what it is that Jesus had to say. Look in Revelation chapter number 20. You ready for God's word? I'm going to begin with verse 10 because in verse 10 of Revelation 20, it's talking about Satan, Lucifer, the devil, that person who sinned against God and was angry with God. He wanted to be like God, but he's been at war with him ever since. This is what it says about Satan, the devil. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is where he was taken. This was where he was sent. The lake of fire and brimstone. People have asked me, they say, Pastor, is it really fire? You know, I don't know. My mind is too small, it's too finite to understand the eternal. There are times that in Scripture it tells us something that's there because there's no way that we have words to understand how bad that really would be. Now, is, if it's fire, amen. It may be worse. I have defined it by this. Everything that is heaven is all the pure good nature of God. Everything that is the good of God is there expressed in heaven. The opposite is what will be in the lake of fire. The opposite. So he says, the devil was cast there. That was the place that he was sent because of his sin and they will be look at the end of that verse and they will be tormented i don't think i need to define that word are y'all good with tormented y'all know what i mean the word of god says and they were tormented day and night forever and ever that means all the time forever and a day Plus one, dot, 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 eternity and beyond. There is no beyond. Tormented. Is the tormented not ever knowing the the goodness of God? Is tormented not ever being in the place where there is any love? Oh, we get a little bit of love down here, but could you imagine being in the place where there's no love, no hope, no joy, no peace? I wouldn't want to be there. Not for a skinny second, much less all of eternity. But if you do not choose God, you will be sent to a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Heaven is prepared for the believers. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. There is a place prepared for us, heaven. But there was a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels that has to be expanded every time someone dies without knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. It wasn't made for them. It was made for Satan, not for you. But if you die as an unbeliever, you'll go join them. Look what it says in verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, who's, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. If you want to look at the proof text for that, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, and it talks about when sin was, was, was judged, this earth and the heaven that had sin in it will be, be uh, cast away. That's why there had to be a new heaven and a new earth, chapter 21, verse 1. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books, B-O-O-K-S, that's plural, many books were opened, period. And another book, singular, one book was opened, which is the book of life. The book of life is the book that records the names of all the people who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, who have asked the Lord for his forgiveness, uh, have asked the Lord to come into their heart and save them and to forgive them. God takes the pen, dips it in his blood, writes it in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, his book of the life-giving gift of eternal life for every believer. 
book, one book, not many ways, one book. So everyone was standing before it. All the unbelievers that are there. Look what it says. And the dead were judged according to their works. This is self-righteousness. How righteous are you? How good do you think you are? You think you're good enough to make it? Anybody in here pure? Anybody in here never sinned? By the things were written in the books. You see, God's watching. When you do something kind to somebody, God's watching. When you help someone up, when you love on someone, God's watching. When you're generous and when you're, you're, you're truthful, God's watching. But when you're selfish, God's watching. When you're hurtful and mean, God's watching. All those things are recorded, every one. Some people say, well, he'll put, on the, put us on the balance beam, and, and he'll put all my sins on one side, he'll take all my righteousness, and then maybe, maybe I'll have more good acts than, no, it only takes one sin. It only took one act. For Satan, who was perfect, it only took one sin to make him a sinner. And he would be judged. Now, he's sinned many times since then, but listen, it only takes one sin to make you a sinner. That's why we as Christians need Jesus' forgiveness. Look what it says in verse 13. The sea and the grave, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to his works. People say, well, I, I, I think I'm just going to stand up and just, just live by my truth, live by the way I feel like it. Well, okay, you'll be judged by it. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death, Sheol, the grave, hell, the place where people go who are held, who are unbelievers, until they're judged. Everyone will have a chance to stand before God. And by the way, if you think you're going to talk your way out of it, it's not going to work. Verse 15 says, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Did you hear that? Everyone who has not been saved will be cast into the lake of fire. The place that he said in verse 10, tormented day and night forever. Take your Bible Let's hear what Jesus had to say about this. Anybody want to know what Jesus had to say? Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, matter of fact, Matthew 24, 25, and Matthew 26 are called the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus is talking with the, those disciples there. When we get to Matthew 25, he tells us a, a parable about those who had talents. He gave one this many amount of talents. Uh, the second one, he gave this many. The third one, he gave uh, only one talent. And, and the first two, they took that talent and they, they invested it and they used it wisely and well. And, and when God came back, he, he doubled the reward. He, the talent that they got, he gave them more. Okay? But then he says to the one who only had one talent, who did not use it, look in verse 28, Matthew 25, verse number 28. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has five, uh, ten talents. That's the one who had five talents. They were doubled, became ten. He says, take it away from him and give it to the one who's got ten. Verse 29. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. If you have Jesus... You have everything, but you're going to learn that you're going to get even more than you had down here. It can be described as super abundance. But from him who does not have, the one who does not have Jesus, even what he has will be taken away. I mean, down here on earth, you may have a, a, a pretty good life. You'll have money. You'll have possessions. You'll have friends. You'll have all those things. But understand, if that's all that you have, that will be taken away. What are you, what is it, what do you value, what is good if you have the whole world and you lose your soul? What's the purpose of it? That's a bad deal. You can have everything good down here, but lose it. And lose so much more. Or you could have Jesus down here. 
and take the love, joy, peace that he's given us and get so much more. I call that a bad deal. Or I call it a great deal if you've got Christ. But look at verse 30. To the one who did not have, verse 30 says, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. Hear Jesus' words here. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen to verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the holy angels with him, then he will sit down on the throne, on his, on his throne, on his throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a sheep shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. God will divide the believers from the unbelievers, the Christians from the non-Christians. And he goes on to describe verse 35, 34 through 40, what it will be like for the one who, who is the believer and the blessings that they'll get. But in verse 41, he says, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. Cursed. Jesus didn't curse them. Their sin cursed them. They were judged by their, their righteous or unrighteous acts. He says, you cannot be with me. Depart from me. All the good of being with God, you will never know. Cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, now here's a clarifying part. I want you to hear this very well, please. Holy Spirit, help us here. Verse 42, for I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also, then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now, he's not talking about righteousness there, and here's the, the right kind of righteousness to live. No, he is saying that, listen, when you repent of your sins, when you come to God and you confess that you have sinned and you know that you need forgiveness and you ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord, your Master, your Savior, you give your life to him and you become what we call a follower of Christ. You just don't say, uh, can I have a little bit of heaven one day? Now, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to be the Lord, and I'm going to be the God of my life. I'm going to be the master of my life. But one day, I'm going to die, and that's when I'm going to need you. So, Jesus, that's when I want you to step in. There are so many people today that, that have just enough Christianity, they say, to get them out of heaven, get them out of hell and into heaven. And I'm telling you, they may not even have that. Because you see, what Christianity is, is not putting a man in heaven. It's putting heaven in a man. And when you accept Jesus and you ask him to come in your heart and your life, your desire is to follow him and obey him and to please him. So if I see someone in need, I just seek to meet that because that's what God desires me to do and that's what God compels me to do. If I see someone naked, I want to clothe them. If I see someone that's hungry, I want to help feed them. Not because I'm going to try to make it into heaven, but because God is living in my heart, is telling me this is what life is about. This is the goodness that is there. So we visit and we minister and we tell the good news and we warn people. You see, I think it's going to be so terrible. It's going to be, it's going to be so scary for those people who say, I, I, I got enough Jesus, and I, I'm sa I went through the baptismal pool. I signed the card. I, asked, I, I joined the church. I, I went to the fellowships. I, I taught a Sunday school class. Look, that's works. But if you're a Christian, your desire, though you're not perfect, come on now, None of us are perfect. Our desire is to please him. And when I do wrong, not if, when I do wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts me. 
and tells me. And, I, and I, how many times have I said, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I messed it. Forgive me. Now look, when I was 10 years old and I bowed on my knees and I invited Christ into my heart, he forgave me of every sin I had done, was doing, or would ever do. I'm constantly forgiven. But listen, when I sin, my, my spirit says, Lord, I, I come to you, forgive me. It's because I want to please him. I want to do right. So when, the, when, the, when I do wrong, I'm convicted. That's evidence that I'm his. But there are so many people that when they do wrong, they want to explain it away. Or they want to, they don't, how dare you tell me I'm wrong? Who are you to tell me I'm wrong? Well, I don't. The Word of God does. You see, there's a, a great divide here. Please hear this. The ones who crucified Jesus thought that they were doing it for God. But really, they were doing it for themselves. We need to be very careful that we're on the right side of this. I'm not trying to get anybody to doubt. No, God wants us to know very plainly that he loves us completely. We're forgiven if you're saved. Feel good. Heaven is, your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. But understand this. Look at verse 26, 46. Matthew 25, verse 46. This is Jesus' own words. These will go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. And they're righteous because the righteousness, though it may be filthy rags, it's become white as snow through the blood of Jesus. Oh, a God of love would never send me away. Really what he's doing is saying, this is what you want. This is what you can have. You don't want my way? Choose your own way. But you're going to live with the consequences. I mean, we need to let that sink in right now. There is this thing that's happening that scares me. I call it creeping universalism. Universalism says everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. And that's wrong. But what scares me is the, the good people that are Christian... Look at the people who are not believers, and there's nothing moves them to tell them, hey, Jesus loves you. And if you, if you choose to go your own way, that's up to you, but understand this. You're going to spend your forever, not in heaven, but in a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. When was the last time you told someone that you loved about Jesus and added to it? And by the way, heaven's not for everybody. Heaven's for the ones who want to be there. Well, I think they need to find their own way. I promise you, if that road was out, if the bridge was out, you'd be there stopping people. Say, hey, be careful. You don't need to go this way. Wouldn't you? But yet we let all the, oh, I can't talk about politics and I can't talk about religion. We just talk about Jesus. I made the decision a lot of years ago that I could never talk about the goodness of glory without also giving you the flip side of it. Your choice. When I go to sleep at night, I don't think, God, you are so you are so blessed to know me. I think, Lord, I am so blessed to know you. And I am. And I hope you do too. But I can't give you half the gospel. I got to give you all of it. I can't just say the way of the cross leads home. I also have to say the way of following your way leads to death forever. The second death. Fire and brimstone, weeping, gnashing of teeth, cursed, punishment, torment. That's the other part of the gospel. Heads bowed, eyes closed.
Lord Jesus, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will come and convict as only you can. Show us our sin, Lord, that we would repent of our sin, believe in you, what you did on the cross of Calvary. Trust in you. Give our heart and life to you and become a follower. Not perfect, just forgiven. But a follower, a disciple of Christ who wants to be a blessing to others and help others become disciples of Christ too. Lord, it's not about living for ourselves, selfishness, idolatry. It's about living for you. So, Lord, if there's anyone here that right now, right now, in this moment, they feel the conviction of their sin and they've never been forgiven, they've never given their heart and life to you, Lord, may they understand that their decision has consequences. They could either spend their eternity with you in the place of glory or hear you say those words, depart from me, I never knew you. Father, help us to choose well. I pray for those that feel that conviction of sin that they will make that decision right now. Whether in this room, watching online, watching live stream, Lord, that right now we will talk to you and confess our sin and ask you to come into our life and save us. Give our life to you. Lord, bless those that are making that decision. In Jesus' name, I pray.